Good afternoon and hello. My name is Lindsay Dankworth, Director of Special Projects here at Gallery Le Long in Co, New York. And I would like to welcome you to the 16th conversation in our series, Gallery Le Long Dialogues. Today's conversation is held on occasion of our exhibition, Ficre Gabriesis, I Believe We Are Lost, on view through this Saturday, May 6th. The exhibition traces the impact of Gabriel's experience as a refugee and immigrant on his practice, with a recurring focus on themes of displacement, representations of Eritrea, and Gabriel's evolving definition of home. Mm -hmm. I am honored to introduce today's speakers and to briefly share about them. If you'd like to learn more, please refer to our website for their full biographies. Kijo Lee, is Chief of Curatorial Affairs and Public Programs at the Museum of African Diaspora, MOAD, in San Francisco. In this role, Lee oversees the strategic direction for the museum's exhibitions and programs, leads globally on identifying and promoting emerging artists from the African diaspora, and works to expand MOAD's reach and influence locally, nationally, and internationally. She is responsible for the overall management and execution of the museum's curatorial vision, including its exhibitions, publications, and public and educational programs, and plays an important role in the organization's outreach, communications, and digital strategy. Lee has a master's degree from and is PhD candidate in history of art and African-American studies at Yale University. Her first book, Perceptual Drift, Black Art and an Ethics of Looking, was published by Yale University Press and the Cleveland Museum of Art in January, 2023. Enuma Okoro is a Nigerian American author, writer, speaker, and cultural curator, born in Manhattan, in raised in Cote d'Ivoire, England, Tunisia, North America, and Nigeria. She is an arts, arts and culture weekend columnist, The Art of Life for the Financial Times, where she writes about the intersection of art, culture, and how we live. Her work includes curating, moderating, and hosting public conversations with culture makers and profiling artists, such as Steve McQueen, Joan Jonas, Kara Walker, Faith Ringgold, Rachel Whiteread, Simone Lee, and others. Her broader research and writing interests include the power of story as a modality for social transformation and the role of the visual arts, culture, intersectional feminist theory, and contemplative eco-spirituality in the study of the human condition, how we live, and how we accumulate and produce knowledge. She especially aims to amplify the creative, intellectual, and psycho-spiritual work of women, female identifying, and artists of the African diaspora and people of color. She has written and edited four nonfiction books, her short story and poetry is published in anthologies, and her essays and articles have been featured in the New York Times, the Financial Times, Aeon, Vogue, The Cut, The Atlantic Monthly, Harper's Bazaar, Artsy Catapult, NYU Washington Review, The Guardian, The Washington Post, Essence, NPR, ABC's Good Morning America, and other media outlets. During this conversation, please feel free to send in questions via the Q&A button. At the end of the talk, we will open up the discussion for a brief question and answer session. This talk will also be recorded and published on our website. Without further ado, Kijo Lee and Enuma Okoro. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think that we are just running through some um, images of the installation for those of you who haven't had a chance to experience it. And Anuma, you had the, the chance to experience I it did. in person, yes? I did. Um, I think it was an opening night. And uh, I, you know, it's interesting. It, the, it was decent, it was pretty, it was very well attended. And even in the midst of all the people as I walked around, I still had such a, I still had such a sense that I was engaging these pieces alone. Mm. Um, and I think part of that is because I found them really haunting. And um, each one really pulled me in. Um, and I just left feeling, you know, afterwards I, I tried to make an Instagram post about it to just sort of share what I thought and I, 
realized that I didn't have any words yet. Um, mm. So, and it was beyond just haunting. I just had a mix of emotions as to what the story sort of evoked in me, both the questions I had, um, but also what they made me think about personally and what made, they made me think about um, how so many of us experience and move through the world mm. simultaneously in such different experiences. Um, That's beautiful. So yeah, something about the variety. And I have to say that with Fee Cray's work, and I ask that we start with this um, work, I believe we are lost, um, because it was one of the first works that I encountered um, uh, way back in, uh, in, in 2012, um, 2011, 2012, when I was first working uh, with um, Elizabeth and uh, Solo and Simon and thinking about um, how to gather all of Fee Cray's work together. And what mm -hmm. struck me most about this particular piece was not just its content, and we can get to that because I know that it, it's, it's it, it can be a bit challenging. It's, it's you know, one of those things where um, interpretation is left quite open. But for me, it was the way it was hung, right? So these mm -hmm. thumbtacks in the wall, mm -hmm. um, uh, the way that um, uh, very lightly at the at the bottom, I believe we are lost is scratched into the surface of that canvas. The way the canvas is cut, I just feel like Fikre must have been so full of so many ideas and so much intellectual and artistic energy that he had to get it out. So I just imagine him just sort of slicing the, the canvas to get right that that mm -hmm. that thing out. Um, but uh, but I would love to hear sort of what what you felt in in as you approached this work in particular. One, yeah. yeah. Um, Kijo, I, I just have to say I love. I love how you take into consideration just the smallest details, you know, yeah. like how it's hung and which are all important, right? In curation, but as viewers, we often don't think about that, but you know how it's hung and the cut of the canvas and all of that immediately just adds more, more de depth to it for me. But when I approached this one, honestly, I, was, I wasn't sure what to make of it. The first thing I saw um, mm. were sea monsters mm -hmm. and, um, we all come to pieces of art with our own, you know, sort of experiences and our own narratives, you know, that we travel with. Um, but I saw sea monsters and the, 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 what I alluded that to immediately is, um, I don't know how we all carry nightmares with us, right? Mm. And, um, and they're creatures that travel with us that may not be monsters to other people, but because of our experiences and stories, um, we have to find a way to live with them. And there's something, there's something really powerful and exorcising mm. about giving them form and shape and painting them and making them bright. Um, I don't know, I think art, it's just another reminder to me. I think art has many, art has many roles and I've never, I've never, I don't always give thought to the role of art as an exorcism. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what this one made me think of. And I don't know much about the story of this particular painting. And in some way I love that though, right? Because most people coming into the gallery, um, most galleries don't have a lot of background knowledge to what they see. Um, but I also think that's the beauty of art, right? Because it also forces me, I can only speak for myself, to think about how what I see on the wall causes me to relate to my own life. So what are the exorcisms I have to embrace? What are the monsters I carry and where do they come from? Um, yeah. And what form might they take? Yeah. Um, and I think that in some ways, uh, and many, I think, of Fee Cray's works, because, um, and I, I, I only had the opportunity to meet Fee Cray once and in passing, um, mm -hmm. before he passed. So I got to know him most through 
uh, working through and cataloging these this more than 800 paintings, this mm -hmm. many hundreds of, of, of works on paper, this mm -hmm. several hundred, you know, these three-dimensional objects, these boxes of coconut shells. And what emerged was um, that he was invested in deep self-excavation. Mm. So mm. what you're speaking to, this kind of exorcism, I, I feel like he sort of lifted out of himself in various ways and in various facets. So to me, uh, this, this, this sort of dream nightmare scape, right? So it feels like this nowhere place, but also aquatic because yeah. of the ways that the shapes curve and seem to be yeah. floating. But then there's also this almost primal scream form um, mm -hmm. that's on my right on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's this way in which it gives a sort of sonic element, even the way that the, sh the brush strokes are, are, are coming out of that open mouth. Um, so it feels to me like a combination of all of those things, right? The darkest deep of the sea where we have those monstrous but fascinating because they survive the, the most inhospitable circumstances at the bottom of the ocean mm -hmm. um, with those uh, uh, spaces of the unconscious and subconscious um, and what form might they take. So I think it's a beautiful way to think of it as an exorcism, simultaneous, like an exorcism and an excavation. Yeah, I love that excavation um, word. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's beautiful. And I also, I also really appreciate how I believe we are lost is, I think, you, you know, you sort of mentioned is just scribble is, you know, scrawled, but also it's really faint, right? And there's this, and the, the title immediately draws you in like this is, this is a collective, a collective lostness. Mm -hmm. And I think there are ways that um, even if we haven't, even if we haven't experienced the same things um, that Fikra has, or so many other people we move with and commune with. You know, there's this, for me, there's this abiding sense that um, when any segment of humanity or any person um, endures a suffering or um, a displacement or um, whatever it may be, that there are ways in which it's, it's always collective, right? Even if we don't wish to acknowledge it. Um, I think it's always collective. And I think that's actually part of the call um, for all of us is to, to recognize that more. Um, yes, and of course he would have been so familiar with the ways that humanity can destroy itself in terms of what having experienced, absolutely. right? War um, in, in Eritrea. Um, and so this ways in which he was very acquainted with personally acquainted with. And then the transformations that happen when you are moved from your home because yeah. of that trauma, like what, and then circulate, right? Yeah. And I think you're also sort of familiar with that circulating experience because you're a global citizen um, um, yourself. So yeah. yes. Yeah. And, and yeah, and there, are, you know, there are many things I know we're moving from that, but I think the themes carry throughout, you know, so that's such a, a wonderful sort of opening with that that image, but the thing, the themes carry throughout the sense of um, not only are we lost, but what is lost? What are all the things that are lost when someone is displaced or um, is forced to move or, because um, there's so many, Kijo, it's not, there's so many from the things that are left behind Right? I mean, the smallest material things that we sometimes think, oh, it's just, these, these are just material things. But we forget that those are the things that give our lives routine and pattern and that make a home, right? So there's the loss of the material, but there's also the loss of what the material symbolizes. Um, of course, there's a loss of people and community and all of those things. But then even when you get to your new location, there are all sorts of new losses that one has to contend with. And there are all sorts of new losses that one struggles with even in order to assimilate, right? Like assimilation often comes at a cost as well. But um, yeah, but I'll, I'll let us move into this next, this next image. No, thank you for that. Thank you for that. 
Um, so this uh, solitary boat tethered is something that we both responded to uh, um, as uh, as a as a, a a moment for us to to have a conversation. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering what drew you, right? So so um, it's yeah. one of the smaller canvases. So I think. Oh, it's on the screen. Wonderful, thirteen and a half by sixteen um, by one. So you know this this uh, as compared to some of the larger canvases, like uh, I believe we are lost. This is just a little jewel. Yeah, and I think the size here really matters. It's so intimate, you know. It's so um, and it's so striking. While I mean, but the colors, you know, the the color palettes, they're such cool. Um, they're such cool colors. Um, yeah, almost there's cool something emotional about those rocks, right? <laughs> yeah, but it's but it's interesting. I mean, they're cool and they're soothing, but at the same time, they're um, they're very isolating. And I don't. This combination is is actually really interesting to me. So the the invitational the invitational pull of the small painting based on the colors and um, and. Uh, I feel like a, a deep sense of longing and loss and and strange possibility actually um, with the emptiness of a tethered boat. Um, yes, there were just so many things that uh, it, this was one of the, the ones I just stood before for a while actually and um, actually would love to have <laughs> <laughs> yes. to think of, of so many things. Yes, and I mean, for me, like as an art historian, this sort of singular boat, but the implication of migration, of yeah, isolation. Yeah. But for me, solitary and isolated, they sort of hang in this interesting tandem with each other, especially in in this boat and many of the boats that um, recur. Uh, mm -hmm. across um, uh, Fikri's body of work. And thinking about especially black figures and boats in art history, there's a there's an um, an essay that I read, I think I think maybe as early as undergrad by Albert Boehm called Blacks in Shark Infested Waters. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of thinking about um, black figures in seascapes and in, in European seascapes and the ways in which they are rendered, um, uh, their agency is either lost mm -hmm. or painted out. Um, and so when I think about this, uh, this vision of a solitary boat, I, I, because of the oars, I think about volition as well. So the ways in which <clears throat> voluntary and an involuntary migration hang in tandem right in this in this one life and in this one space um uh but i also it appeals to me the kind of icy blues right there's an edge to this that allows you to experience the 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 loneliness but also there's like to me an iciness like a a um uh, a a temperature register that is singular for this one because I'm I'm hoping if we can look at the the solitary boat in red and blue, right? So this is a very different <laughs> Absolutely. Um, representation. So these boats also That's so interesting shift right in mood and in 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 how they occupy space and what kind of space they occupy. Have you seen this one before? No, it, it, it's not in the exhibition. No, 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 it, yeah. Yeah, but to see them juxtaposed right next to each other right away. Yes. Um, um, <laughs> is, really, is really striking, but also, I don't know, it makes me, you know, some of the things running through my head is like, we need both boats. Exactly, yes. You know? Um, and life, life is full of both boats. And I don't know that I see the other boats, the previous one is, I, I don't see it as all negative in any way mm -hmm. at all. Um, mm -hmm. But this one definitely has kind of a, a joy to it. It has, I mean, the colors, those look like to me, they're birds, the green, you know, growth, the reflection, you know, the fact that the water's clear enough to have a reflection. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, and I had the opportunity to write about this work in this 
exhibition catalog that we put together to go with the first exhibition of B. Cray's work at Artspace in New Haven um, in 2013. And what I found so interesting is, right, this one is Orless. It, yeah. it occupies this kind of dreamscape. Yeah. And there's like inside out, this play between inside and outside and where we might place ourselves and this, this uh, hmm. extremely expansive imaginative space. And if we can go back to the previous boat, which is which feels so much more terrestrial, but we need both. I think you're absolutely right. And again, there's this sort of breadth that I think you get some experience of in the exhibition mm -hmm. of ideas. And it seems to me that Figure was always working through something and he would continue with the form mm -hmm. in all these different uh, colorways, um, in all of these different spaces and no spaces as mm -hmm. a means of sort of working out that excavation, that kind of, he was a kind of archeologist to my mind. Um, both in digging out art histories, but also all of these cultural um, uh, spaces that he's occupied, but bringing together seven languages and mathematics and, and you know, the, you know, his culinary prowess. So it's just really interesting that I think he was so um, invested in having us experience all of these senses, but in a similar form. How many different ways can you experience the boat? Mm. And I love that they're empty. Mm -hmm. um, because that immediately causes you to, there's an entryway for you, you know, for you and your own story and your own, um, yeah. I really loved this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, for so many reasons. Um, for so many, I mean, some of them are obvious, right? The road, the journey, right? But also it made me think about, it made me think both historically, but in other ways about borders, you know? And um, I can't look at this without thinking of um, all the history around the Ethiopia and Eritrean border, actually. And, and also how borders are so, um, they're not real, they're, they're made up, <laughs> you yes. know, and yes. they can shift depending on who's in power, right? And um, yes, I think he makes that so present materially, right? By using this pastel, the way that the red intervenes on the black, like you can't get that clean edge. Those boundaries are always yeah. porous. They're yeah. always sort of made up. So the, the the very even materiality of the work kind of lends itself. So the way that this black bisects that rust, it's this spilling over. So even, even the roads that are built right on dusty land, this, this kind of imagined control over, mm -hmm. over that space. Um, so mm -hmm. I was also really uh, uh, taken by, by this work. It has been delightful because there are some works that because um, it was sort of 10 years ago that I was so deep in, into this archive. So it's bringing back so many beautiful memories of discovery. Mm. Um, and the other thing about this too is it's um, besides the borders of the canvas, there's no beginning or end to this road, mm -hmm. right? Like there's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, mm -hmm. And in some way, I think about the, I think about the ongoing journey, not just of us as, as people, but of, of refugee status and of um, people who are forced to flee for various reasons. You know, that even when you reach that supposed destination of safety, things are far from over, right? Like that, that journey is, is ongoing in so many ways of the things you're still reckoning with and um, the people that are still behind. I mean, there's so many things that I think in our, for most of us in our mind, you know, we have this, we have such a simplified, we have such a simplified idea of, and, I, and most of it is because it's likely most, because we can't imagine this, right? And also we don't give enough time to thinking about this. Yeah. We have such a simplified idea of what it means to flee a country and to arrive somewhere else, right? It's so, in our minds, so black and white. And um, it is so far from black and white, right? And so this, 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 this road that, that continues off the canvas to me, um, 
really just kind of speaks to that. And um, the rust, I know it can speak to the earth, but it's it, to me, it evokes other things as well. And uh, I don't know, I, you know, if what's interesting, Kijo, we're talking about this, all of this right now, while history is sort of repeating itself in Sudan, right? And as I was preparing for this and just kind of looking through the images again, I kept thinking about how simultaneously life is happening in very different ways in another part of the world, right? Where people are fleeing and going to neighboring countries. And I know I, I read in Fikra's history that um, he left on foot to Sudan, right? And I, uh, yeah, the, the world is, it continues that road, right? It continues. It yes, thank you. <laughs> and it's just, uh, it's all, it's really, it's really hard to, to, to hold and to grasp that literally, as we're talking about this, there's another reality, you know, happening. And yes. uh, yeah, anyway. In some ways that it makes me think of some of, you know, Fikre's early work so in the 90s and the palette was very very dark and it mm -hmm. was um there were lots of enclosures mm -hmm. um, um and so I think that you're absolutely right and you know I I have been known to say there's no such thing as, as an art emergency but there's an urgency embedded in art right so I feel like there is a just like I believe we are lost, there's an urgent call, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? That we are, that we invest in in an in understanding of the endlessness of this kind of. Um... Mm. You know, I always think about it. I know we're going to move from this any minute, mm -hmm. but I always think about what absences evoke to and suggest, you know, that it's, it would be, it's easy to look at this and, um, I don't know. I, th I think the longer you, you look at a piece of art, you look at a work, obviously, the more you engage with it and the more I think you give it freedom to sort of speak back to you and you begin to have a conversation um, with the work. But um, I'm just really struck by what absence can speak to. What is, I wonder, different viewers who, different viewers who come to this, mm -hmm. I would love to know what, what they fill the space, what they fill the space, the absence with, you know, mm -hmm. like what, pops up for them why don't um, we ask? maybe people can put in the chat oh yes please put that in the chat <laughs> i don't know if we can see the chats but um we can, we can. Yeah. okay okay yeah what do you think of this one i know i i this is one i love but i'm curious what you thought about this yes. one i mean i think again it is this um so i immediately my eye rises to the top um, and I think in some ways that's on purpose, those mountain peaks all lead me to the plains, right? Uh, is it arrival or departure? Is it, you know, damnation or salvation? Is it, um, um, and then thinking about the protective quality of those trees, the ways that they cover uh, what appear like domiciles in that in the foreground and so for me it was like think considering because this, these are not these are not landscapes that I've occupied mm -hmm. and so um, uh, attempting to sort of cast myself into that space and understand what it might mean to hover in the space under those trees and wonder as well is that damnation or salvation flying above Mm. I am um, that's so interesting my eyes went directly to the trees mm. so mm -hmm. um yeah yeah so yeah no please say more no no I'm just thinking they went directly but as, as soon as you point out the planes I'm like that gives it a completely different right a complete, <laughs> But that's yeah, the way we all sort of step toward it. And oh, it I know, yeah, which is great. It's, it's really interesting. But I went straight to the to the trees and to nature and to these dwellings. And um, yeah. to me, it just immediately evoked um, a sense of, again, I keep coming back to longing, but to home, right? And um, 
you know, there I, I've seen similar landscapes and I'm from a place that has similar landscapes. And uh, um, and I think trees are such a symbol of life and of persistence and trees are, trees bear witness to so much that um, when they're left to live, <laughs> Mm -hmm. they are, trees are also bearer of memories, right? They're, they're memory keepers is the way I think about them. And um, they bear witness to so much. And uh, I think, of, I really do think of trees as living beings beyond just the fact that, you know, biologically, but, um, and they offer shade and they offer nourishment and they, they feed us as well as, so I, to me, this was a really life giving. I'm, yeah, yeah. It in a network underneath, right? This rhizomatic yeah, yeah. And it's happening that's allowing them to sustain in a space that absolutely is inhospitable. Yeah. So even though there are no people in this image, to me, there's the I still see witness bearers, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's, there's always something that testifies, like the earth can testify to 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 injustice, right? And to um trouble and um and the earth can also be, yeah, hold our hold our our memories so it's it's yeah absolutely mm. <laughs> yeah this one how are we doing for time this one was really because i know we want to leave time for questions but again this this was a a, a a haunting for me in a way you know these sort of abstract figures mm -hmm. and that also look like they could be immersed in flames mm. um, And I, I didn't have much of an interpretation for this, but I was just really drawn to it. I really liked it. Um, I think that one of the things that I love about Figueres' work so much is his use of color. Mm -hmm. There are moments in which he, he doesn't use a lot of sort of hard line. It's sort of color against color. And in these pastels, you get it so beautifully, the way he's sort of laying that pink next to that blue. And I see what you're saying about the flames, especially sort of in that central figure toward the back that's in blue with the red and yellow rising. But it also made me think of sort of um, how different kind of, uh, of just sort of a campfire at an encampment. Um, mm -hmm. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. There's a haunting nature to it because the, the figures are so ethereal, right? Yeah. Like they just yeah. pass out of existence or blow out of existence at any moment. Yeah. Um, but I also see them as this sort of, it makes me think of how he was trying to capture a particular kind of fabric or a particular kind of diaphanousness, right? A particular kind of the way the fabric has to be both warm, but also weightless so that you're not carrying. It just made me think of all of the ways that he was attempting to capture the, the materiality of a moment. Mm. Um, uh, but also thinking of this collectivity, this collection of, of people, how they are, are perhaps how they blend right through the medium of the pastel as well. So they, you can sort of pick out individual figures, but their borders kind of blur with each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, this to me goes along, I think the next image, mm -hmm. and I think in the exhibition they come, yes. Okay, so I, I, I see these two together in my mind. Mm -hmm. So when I think of the flames here, I also think of a campfire mm -hmm. um, and, this one in particular, which I can connect to the last one we, we just spoke about. This one, it, you know, it just immediately drew to my mind the, 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 the role of um, West African, I think you call them griot, griots, griots, yeah. like the, story, the keepers of stories, the storytellers. And even though that's a, you know, that's primarily a West African motif, at least the terminology, right, is, is Malayan from eons ago, 15th century, but it's still something I think is common to just ask yes, yes. <laughs> and, and also the other that, yeah yes. his artist statement he he calls himself oh. a storyteller and how that is a part of east african culture is this storytelling this yep. ability to narrate yeah and in some way his to me his his art is is a form of 
griotism, if I can make that a word, it's a form of sort of <laughs> passing the story down. And um, and I, I, I connect sort of his love of music to, you know, the, the again, back to the, the way music and poetry perform in the act of passing down the narratives, you know, of, of griots. And um, this just really made me think of that. Yes. Especially, you know, when we think about, when we think about the, the legends and fables or, or when these stories are passed down, it's usually in the evening around a campfire or under a tree or, you know, those sort of, um, but at the same time, this could also be a very ominous scene, I don't know, but it, it's just what he, it evoked for me. And the nighttime and the blue, to me, that's more, and the fact that they're away from the, the water, if that's water, but then I also don't know if that's the horizon, that's the moon. Right, yes, yes. Again, yeah, there he plays with the perspective and where things, where the dividing line is. This, this is one of the works I was speaking to earlier, these sort of 90s um, mm -hmm. earlier works in his body of mm -hmm. works where there appear to be a lot of enclosures, a lot of smaller groups. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, there was this sense of security, like as though you could sort of pull back. But And I think that you're absolutely right. I have a whole separate <laughs> reference point for that storytelling because I was a camp counselor for six summers. <laughs> <The girls can't, laughs> right? And so, and there will be moments still where the stories recur or the songs or the ways in which they become, you know, they create a kind of neural pathway after a while Absolutely. of, of yeah. the ways that these things transform and transfer. And I think you're absolutely right. Although it seemed to me, and I may, um, again, be misreading, but this is such a, a um, there is a gendered nature to these two images. So this seems like a very sort of masculine exchange that seems to be happening in this space. And if we looked back at the other, perhaps because of the coloration in my own biases, right? Based on that, this seems to be a much more feminine, feminized space, right? So not landing on the biology of any of the folks that are involved, but just the sort of gendered representation, um, um, this kind of soft diaphanousness. And then if we go back to the next one, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> there's something a bit different everyone is standing, it seems more alert to me and at attention. It seems to me that they are looking out versus a kind of inwardness. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I can definitely see that. This one definitely does feel like it has more male energy, but funny enough, the previous one, I didn't see it as, as either, I yeah. didn't see it as female, which isn't, a, which it just is. I just saw, I just thought it was but yeah, but that makes sense. I mean, that's one way to read it for lots of reasons, right? Lots of cues. Um, um, this one, I think we both loved this. <laughs> yes. Yes. Again, for me, it was like this way of building form out of color. Mm -hmm. So rather than having these sort of hard lines and then this reflective surface, the, 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 I don't know, it's so energetic, the bend in the body, the bend in the reflect, I, it just felt yeah, like very, um, oh. Yes, yes. Exactly. yes. <laughs> exactly. All yeah. response kind of thing. Yes. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, yeah, 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 please. No, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just thinking about the transformation in his work from sort of the early 90s until so some of these same colors might recur, but the palette lightens incredibly um, mm -hmm. um, over the sort of 2000s. Um, and the ways in which, but some aspects remain the same, the way that he's playing with color, the way that the figure is always a little bit abstracted in this, in these interesting ways. But what was your, your sort of thoughts about it? Anyway? Um, a couple, I, I loved, I loved how it, where it was in the exhibition, it was sort mm -hmm. of a breather. You know, mm -hmm. and it also reminds you that we carry so many stories and narratives with us, right? So even in the midst of the, the, the real challenging and difficult ones that there are also memories and stories of, of love and joy. And, and sometimes those are the ones that sustain us in the midst of, um, so to me, it was just a, uh, it was symbolic of, of life, right? And of the reality that, that our life is a combination and a mix of these both the horror and the beauty and all of us are called to figure out how to hold both of those things because they usually happen simultaneously you know in in our lives um 
So it was just a, to me, it was just a reminder of, of those things. And um, yeah. And that it's, you know, and also that it's okay, just this last thing, that it's okay to, it's okay to hold on to and to sort of call forth the joy and the beauty, even in the midst of pain and suffering. Because sometimes I think actually, either we feel guilty about doing that, or we feel that, um, that it takes away from the reality of everything else. Um, yeah, and I think for, for Fikre, when just to round it back to the beginning, when you were talking about the ways that he was always, or the way you experienced his work as reflecting home in some ways, you know, so he found home, right, in Elizabeth, in Simon and Solo, and so the ways that he was producing, it allowed, I think it allowed that spark of joy to remain, even as he was recalling um, um, those other painful circumstances, how, you know, there would always be that thread of connectivity to that home base which is really which is really it's really beautiful to kind of you've seen this more than I have but to sort of see his work evolve over time and how it shifted yes. as he met Elizabeth and created oh family here and yes. um, and then so, she became a feature so yes yeah, so yes. <laughs> yes yeah thank you both so much um I've written, I've taken so many notes. I mean, just ending there on how we hold, how we can hold the beauty and the horror together within us and, and, and keep going is extraordinary. But I love thinking of, of Fikre as the archeologist is excavating and, and the dream, the dreams is something that comes up a lot in the dreamscape, but also the nightmare and the dreamscape, nightmare scape. Um, and I'm struck too, and, and I do want to say, if anyone has questions, please send those in so we can ask the speakers before we sign off in a few minutes. Um, I do have a couple of questions myself, if, if we don't have others. Um, the first, um, Kijo, I just would love to rewind and, and just to make it clear for everyone who's listening, you know, Kijo was involved in, in cataloging the, the whole body of work um, after Fikre's passing and curating the first show and publishing the first catalog. And, and so for those of us who wish we could have experienced that but didn't, I, I'd just love to hear your impressions of what was that like, that first opening that first show, because yes. many people were not aware he was an artist or they knew, but they hadn't seen a lot of work. And then suddenly they were surrounded by, by so many works. And, and I'd love to hear what that experience was like. Of course. So, I mean, first it was the cataloging. So stepping into Fikre's double studio in Erector Square in New Haven, there, were, there was a lot of work. There was work still on the walls. Uh, paintbrushes still out. Um, and then, uh, you know, working with Elizabeth to bring everything from the attic of their house and from an external cold storage space. And so I'm standing in this studio and I'm like, oh, wow. And eventually we came to over 800 paintings from two by two inches to these huge murals of all sorts of themes. And so opening the show was both this incredible labor of love, but also I will admit highly, highly anxiety producing because it was both uh, an introduction and a retrospective and it needed to be like juicy so that people understood how incredible the work is, but also had the gravitas to support how, how what an impeccable human being he was. And how much he meant to the community and to Elizabeth and to validate, right, that love that supported that work. And for me, it was also about the fact that Fikre was what made it possible for me to have Elizabeth as mm -hmm. a mentor and intellectual lead because he made her whole household work. So there was a way in which I wanted it to be almost like a salon experience where you walked in and you were sort of struck by the sheer breadth of things, but then anchors of themes that would allow you to, and it was 
it was incredible because art space in New Haven is a sort of community driven contemporary art space. We got to be a bit scrappier than we would have been able to be if we were in, you know, the University Art Gallery, no shade, you know, I love it. But um, <laughs> there's a way in which we were able to experiment with the way things hung and having to rearrange because things were cut on an angle um, <laughs> uh, or, or it didn't look quite right in that space. Um, mm -hmm. And then the catalog, it was, how do we produce something that is kind of a talisman for this first time out mm -hmm. that kind of captures the spark of his life with the pain of his loss that was happened that happened so soon. You know, Elizabeth, we jumped in so soon after he passed away. And I think it was a way, I hope, for everyone to kind of metabolize that loss in a way that felt mm. uh, big enough, right, for the space that he occupied to just kind of give that entry point that now Gallery Lalong has stepped into. I hope that was an that answered the question. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank was, you. Yes. Well, we're we're all here very grateful for all you've done, and I just wanted everyone listening to understand the extent to. So thank you, thank you. Um, well, we're gonna have to close pretty soon, but I, Enuma, I did just have one thing. I was really struck by um, when you spoke of whenever any one person experiences a loss, a trauma, a displacement, that it's actually also a collective experience, what that means. And I was reading also some of your writing about dreams recently because there are connections with the shows. And one thing that also stuck out was when you wrote, though our dreams are our own, we often need a community to keep them alive. And I just thought maybe we could close on a, some additional thoughts on the collective, on the community, because even though this is a very individual experience about one person's journey, yeah. there is also very clearly the sense of the collective, I think, but I'd, I'd like your thoughts, both of yours. No, I think so too, but I also think um, I, I, my, my belief is just that even if we, do, even if we aren't, we are not conscious of it, um, or choose to feel it. I do think that all of us, um, um, that we all lose something when someone else suffers. I really believe that. And I think, um, I think in an ideal world, right? And the, 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 the continual goal um, towards making the world a just and beautiful place for all, even if we don't see it in our lifetime, is to get to the place where we recognize how much we need each other and how much our own wellness is dependent, dependent on, other, on the, the wellness of others. But I think we're so used to believing in this sort of individual independence, what happens to you happens to you, that I don't even think we realize how much we, we ourselves are diminished by that. And so um, until you have something, usually it takes a crisis, right, where, um, where you really, a stranger helps you and all of a sudden you value that person in a, way, in a way that you never have before. Or when someone sees you in crisis and they remove themselves to help you, I think it's a, it's a piece of humanity that's coming from a very internal place that is actually more what most of us are. And so I, I just really believe that even if, we, even if we can't acknowledge it, that there is a way in which we ourselves are diminished when other people, um, are suffering or at, or at a loss or when they are not whole, I guess. Um, in the same way that I think joy multiplies. <laughs> and I think, uh, so that's just something I, I, I really believe. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we have two well, people. Oh. <laughs> are coming in and saying thanks. I know, I right? know we have to, I know we have to um, wrap up because um, we do have to get our speakers on with the rest of their days, but I need to thank you both so very much on behalf of all of us here. We're so grateful for your time, your consideration and, and all your thoughtful perspective on these works. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to everyone that is tuning in and also watching the recording later on. Um, the exhibition, Fikra Gabriesis, I believe We Are Lost, is on view through this Saturday. So if you haven't come in and you're able to, please do.
Thank and you thank all. You, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all. Bye-bye.